Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And the King James text today reads, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. How badly do you want it? If you'll bow your heads with me one more time. Master, Savior, soon coming King, we appreciate today the presence of the Lord we feel in the house of God. Our hearts are glad and we're full of gratitude and thanksgiving today, Lord, for the events of recent days. But we must set this aside at this moment in order to receive nourishment from the Word of God. We need, Lord, to hear from heaven. We always need to hear from heaven. For the Word of God declares, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Preaching of the gospel is a divine exercise. The Spirit of the Lord works through the preacher and helps the Word of God to effectively, efficiently go from his or her lips to the ears of those that hear and convinces the hearer in their heart that what they are hearing is in fact a message from the Creator, the Redeemer, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Master, we need the anointing. Any attempt to preach without it is an empty attempt. It is a vain attempt. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Anoint your messenger today, O God. I humbly implore you, anoint the ear of every hearer that we might receive the Word of God with gladness. Master, grant it, we pray, for we ask it in none other than Jesus, Jesus, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I doubt that there are very many of us, at least, who grew up celebrating holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas especially Thanksgiving. I doubt there are very many of us who have not at some point in time experienced a delay in the meal getting to the table. You know, it seems to me when we go over to Grandma Bell's house for Thanksgiving or when we would have Thanksgiving at our own home, you know, Mom would say we're going to try to eat around, you know, 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock. See, uh, we do things different up north. We generally have our Thanksgiving meal like around lunchtime. And then that way we can roll around the house, you know, all full and, uh, you know. And then dinner time we start picking on the leftovers, you know. Some people have their meal later in the evening. We do ours earlier in the day. And so mom might say, we're going to try to have dinner at 12 o'clock. We're going to try to have dinner at 1 o'clock. Or Grandma Bell might say similar. And then you get to the house and, you know, you haven't eaten because you know they're gonna, there's going to be a feast laid out. And, you know, and you're trying to leave as much room as you can. You don't want to fill up on breakfast. You, know, you don't want eggs and bacon on Thanksgiving morning. Oh, no, no, no. You want to be able to have lots of room in there. Uh, that ain't just the turkey that gets stuffed. It's the turkeys eating the turkey that gets stuffed. And we want to leave room. So... You're sitting there and you might be watching television or visiting with family members, whatever the case might be. And every once in a while you pop your head in the kitchen, Grandma, Mom, how close are we to dinner being ready? Because I sure am hungry. Oh, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm ready to eat. Grandma says, well, we're running a little bit late. 
How many times have you heard that when dinner is being prepared for Thanksgiving? We're running a little bit late. It'd be just a little bit longer. And then after a while, we kind of walk into the kitchen and we go up to mom or we go up to grandma. We put our arm around her. She's trying to put her bow down in front of the stove and open the door and pull out the yams or pull out the cream bean casserole or whatever or baste the turkey. And we say, Grandma, Mom, uh, how much longer is it going to be? Well, just run a little bit late, but it, it'll be ready in a little while. And, oh, look over there. Mm. Yeah, they got some uh, rolls over there. Boy, that sure looks good. And so as we leave the kitchen, we just happen to brush our hand against the tray of rolls and lift one off the tray, sneak it out into the living room, boy, and we're nibbling on that roll because we're hungry. We're hungry. And boy, I mean, by the time, by the time that meal gets set out on the table and everything's laid out, half the rolls have already been eaten. The turkey's already been picked at because even the cook gets hungry. And, you know, they're slicing up the turkey, and I mean they're kind of taking a little piece here and a little piece there. You know, I, well, i got to test them yams. We can't put them out on the table without me taking a big old spoonful first, <clears throat> making sure they taste good. And, oh, I mean to tell you, that meal's about half eight before it ever hits the table because people are hungry. When Grandma... When mom puts that meal out on the table, how often does your mother or your grandma or anybody have to turn around and say to those who have gathered for that holiday, how badly do you want to eat? How often do they have to ask, how badly do you want it? Come and get it. No, they don't have to ask how badly do you want it. All they have to say is, come and get it, right? Amen. But today I'm asking, how badly do you want it? In the Lord's famous Sermon on the Mount, he made a series of statements that were married to promises. The poor in spirit, he said, will possess the kingdom of God. Those who mourn shall be comforted. The meek will one day become heirs to the entire earth. And in verse 6, as we read today, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be fed. They will be hydrated. They will be satisfied. And they will be filled. Righteousness is the desire to do right. The desire to be right. We want to do right by our neighbor. We want to do right by those with whom we do business. We want to do right by our children. We want to do right by our spouse. Do you know in the Word of God, especially if you read it in the uh, New International Version, there are passages in the Old Testament related to divorce that actually tells us excuse me, not divorce so much as adultery, that actually tells us that when an individual commits adultery, uh, that they are literally committing violence against their spouse. That's how God sees it. See, God doesn't look at things the way we look at things. People in this world, you know, Christians are so funny. They think they know how God looks at abortion. They think they know how God looks at gay rights. They think they know how God looks at this and that. And they could not be any more wrong. The Word of God said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high is my understanding as it compares to yours. Human beings can't even begin to get on God's level and understand things from God's perspective. He looks at human sexuality. He looks at um, uh, issues in this world today not even remotely close to the way we look at them. He sees them so differently. And yet we have people in the church who are so proud and who are so arrogant as to believe that they understand the mind of God and they understand God's perspective. Without divine revelation, you will never understand God's perspective on these things. 
But let me tell you now. Jesus said in the first six verses, and in verse six in particular, he said, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I'll tell you something. You're never going to know what righteousness is. You're never going to be able to act right. You're never going to be able to behave right and to do right. And to do right by your spouse and do right by your uh, children and do right by your community and do right by your neighbor and do right by your co-worker and do right by those with whom you do business uh, and certainly do right by God. You're never going to be able to do this as long as that desire to do right is only in your head. See, there's a lot of Christians in the world today, a lot of people in church this afternoon or today, uh, who understand that God wants us to do right. And therefore, based on that cognitive understanding of God's desire for us to behave right and to do right, they, you know, they put forth the effort to do right and to act right. And, they, and some people obviously put in a lot more effort than others do. But the Word of God says that those who would attain righteousness, who would be filled, who would receive all the righteousness that can possibly be served are only those who hunger and thirst after it. Isn't it funny? How many times have you heard the Sermon on the Mount preached? And boy, I mean to tell you, a preacher will go through and he'll just start at verse 1, go all the way down through practically the whole chapter, and they'll just brush up against each point. All those who mourn will be comforted. Hallelujah. Those who are poor in spirit will uh, be inheriting the kingdom of God. Those who are meek will inherit the earth. And they go through each point, and you know, it's, it's just, each point is just a little bullet point. But as I I was praying and asking God for a message this week. The Lord spoke this scripture to my spirit. I, I do not preach based on what I've read in the Word of God that week or what, you know, some passage jumps out and speaks to me. That's not how I hear from the Lord to preach. I literally pray and ask God, Lord, what do you want me to preach? What do you want me to preach? What do you want me to preach? And all week long, I leave my spirit open. Lord, speak to me. Give me... Tell me what you want me to And he literally spoke to me this week, this very passage. He said, I said, blessed are they who hunger and who thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, Lord, that's just one bullet point. In all of the Sermon on the Mount. Oh no it's not. There is enough in that one passage for a message. Probably for a series of messages. Amen. No. In order to be filled where righteousness is concerned. We must first hunger for it. How many of us today have a deep inward groaning and desire and a burning passion for righteousness. How many of us want so badly to do right and to act right by God and by our fellow man, by our family, by our spouse? How many of us have a desire that is so internal and so much a part of us that it manifests itself as a hunger or as a thirst. I know for me personally, I can't speak for everybody, but I know for me personally, when I act in a way that isn't right, and it happens, and we all have those days where we don't act right, you know, we are in a bad mood, we're not feeling well, or whatever the case might be, and, and we act out in a way that isn't right. It's not in keeping with righteousness. I know for me personally that I wind up leaving that experience and just feeling awful, just feeling terrible. 
I don't just walk away from that experience and feel bad, you know, days later or weeks later. I don't just feel bad for a day or so. No, I walk away and I feel really bad about it. And I feel bad about it for days, sometimes weeks and months. Why? Because deep down within me, there is this desire more than anything to be righteous. Amen. To do right and to act right. And when I when I don't do right, when I don't act right, it's such a disappointment to me. It, 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 it hurts me. It troubles me so badly. How many people are in church? We, we used to have somebody that come to church a while back. I'm not going to name any names or anything. But this individual cracked me up because they'd get up and testify, boy, and they'd give you this big old testimony and they'd just make it out to be the best testimony ever was. And I appreciated the testimony. It'd be a nice testimony. But then after church, we'd be sitting at a meal, having fellowship and talking, and this person talk about how they gave somebody a beat down or how they got into an argument with somebody and, boy, they let them know in no uncertain terms. You remember, Booby? And I'd be sitting there and I'd be saying to myself, how in the world can you go from the testimony to this? And they'd be talking about it like they were bragging, you know, like, like they had something to brag about. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I, I don't understand the perspective this person's coming from because that's not how my mind works. I'm hungry for righteousness. I'm thirsty for righteousness. Righteousness, doing right, acting right, being right, is something that is so much a part of me. It is, it is such... A serious need within me. I don't just understand cognitively that God wants me to act right and be right, but it's something that has become such a desire in my spirit and in my heart that the pangs for it uh, are similar to hunger and the desire for it is similar to thirst. I'm going to tell you, if you've ever really been thirsty, I'm not talking about, you know, you're driving in your car, you're going somewhere, and you're driving miles and miles, and by God, they're in a single exit, they're in a single uh, place that you can stop and get yourself a big gulp. We've all been there at times, right? And you say, man, I'm so thirsty. I, I just need to get something thirsty. But I'm talking about if you've ever really been thirsty. I will never forget as long as I live. I was a young person, and the Assemblies of God that I grew up in, had a program for young men called the Royal Rangers. It's a program similar to the Boy Scouts. Excellent program, and it's extremely well put together. I mean, it is so much like the Boy Scouts, it, it's extremely well put together. And we went on a trip one time locally to our church, to a farm that one of our church members owned. He owned a lot of land. And, of course, he farmed a lot of that land, but he also had woods and what have you. So we went camping out in the woods on this man's land. And it turns out he also had some caves on his property that we were able to explore. So my uncle David Doobie, I'll never forget it. Mom, you remember David. He was one of our Royal Ranger leaders. I loved him. Uh, David told us one morning, he said, we're going to go explore some caves today. He said, now, bring canteens with water. You are going to need water. Bring your canteens and bring water. Because we're going to be gone the best part of the day, and you're going to get thirsty. We're going to be sweating. We're going to be, you know. So make sure you bring water. Well, I'm going to tell you, half us kids just like most young men, we knew better than the leader of the group. We knew better than Uncle David. I'm not carrying no canteen full of water. My Lord have mercy. That canteen weighs about three or four pounds, and I ain't carrying that thing over. I'll just drink water when I get back to the camp. That's all. David didn't force us to bring canteens. No. Him and Gordon Bleacher and whoever else was our leader at the moment, you know. So we went to the caves. It turns out these caves 
where to get into the caveman, you had to get down on your belly and crawl because there were just little openings, you know, and you'd crawl through, and then it opened up into a much bigger space. So here we are crawling on our bellies, we're sweating, it's hot, you know, and we're going and we're exploring these caves and it was fun, it was an amazing experience. But every minute we were out there, we were getting thirstier and thirstier and thirstier. I can honestly say I have never been this thirsty in my entire life. I will never forget when we finally made our way out of those caves and we started heading back to the camp. Man, many of us boys, we did not walk back to camp. We ran back to camp. Man, we were at a mad dash to get back to the campground, to get back to our tents, to get back to our canteens because we were so thirsty. And I will never forget as long as I live, I will never forget opening that canteen. You know, you have to unscrew the top of the canteen, lifting it to my lips and pushing the back end up and letting that liquid gold fall on my parched tongue. I'll never forget as long as I live. Oh, that water tasted so good. Oh, that water just touched. Oh, my God, I've never had water as delicious as this. I've never experienced water in this way before. Oh, dear God, this is good. Oh, this is good. Some Somebody must have gone to heaven and visited the, the springs of eternal water up there because this water is the best water I've ever... Well, it's the same water you get out of your sink at home. It's no different. But man, it didn't taste like the same water. Why? Because it was different water? No, because my situation was different. I was thirsty. I wasn't just thirsty. I was dehydrated. I was parched. I've been in Pentecostal church services, especially camp meetings in the church of God. And I remember moves of God in that congregation during certain church services where the Spirit of the Lord came down and we experienced thousands of people in the tabernacle experienced just the most I, I can't hardly describe it it was it was an experience I'll never forget as long as I live we experienced the love of God it literally felt like the Lord just reached down to this room full of people and wrapped his arms around us and pulled us close to his breast and you literally felt the love of God in a way that you have never felt the love of God before. The experience was life-changing. It was so amazing. I, I still to this day remember it just as vividly as if it happened yesterday. It was the most amazing. And then I remember one service when... You know, we Pentecostal folks, we like to shout, we like to dance, we like to run the aisles. But this particular service, a stillness came over the entire congregation and, and a quiet came over the congregation. And the Spirit of the Lord descended like a cloud. I mean, you didn't see a cloud, but you felt this presence of God just coming down into the tabernacle. And all of a sudden, you could feel the holiness of God. I can't describe it. I, I can't explain it. All of a sudden, you, you felt how far God was from you in terms of righteousness, in terms of holiness, you suddenly became just painfully aware 
It reminded me of the Old Testament prophet in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne. And he was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And I remember the prophet said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. All of a sudden, in the presence of God, the prophet was made just so aware of the fact that how could I even speak for God? Because I'm, I'm a person who so often says things I shouldn't say. I'm a person who so often says things that shouldn't even be said. And I dwell amongst the people who, who behave in this fashion. And as God is saying, who will go for us and whom will I send? The prophet I'm a man of unclean lips. You see, when you stand before the Lord and you feel his presence in this powerful way, all of a sudden you realize how, how much different you are from God. And his righteousness and his holiness made us up. But do you know what? That same experience made you want so badly to do right and to be right. And all of a sudden, as the presence of the Lord came down, and as you felt his holiness, you could feel in your spirit this hunger growing. Oh God, oh God, oh God, help me, Jesus, to be more like you. Help me, Lord. To live more like you. Help me God. Oh God. What I'm feeling is so amazing and so wonderful. But I know at the same time that I am miles from being anything like this. But just imagine how wonderful it would be to feel that every day, right? Lord, help me to be more like you. Help me. All of a sudden this hunger began to grow inside of us. The realization of the Lord's promise that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness would be filled is found in John chapter 6, verses 32 through 35. When is hunger satisfied and when is our thirst quenched? It is quenched and it is satisfied in response to faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to me, children. Righteousness is found in that faith, not in response to that faith, but righteousness is found in that faith. John 6, 32-35 reads, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, Listen, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Hallelujah. So he's using the same identical language as our primary text. He said, he that believeth on me will never be hungry, will never thirst. The word of God said, blessed is he that hunger and thirsteth after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, if Jesus is saying that faith in me is going to fill you, hallelujah, what is he saying? He's saying that faith in me causes you to come into possession of righteousness. Hence, you are full. You are filled. You are no longer thirsty. Oh, hallelujah. Our righteousness is in Him. It's not in our actions. It's not in our words. It's not in our behaviors. It's not in our thought processes. Our righteousness is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Amen. Yes. Righteousness is found in our faith. Not in response to our faith. But the Lord says to attain righteousness, 
one must hunger and thirst for it. It is not enough to want it, or even to want it badly. The desire for it must become an intrinsic, intense need for it. Hunger is a physiological response to the absence in our bodies of the food we, we require to create energy. Thirst is the physical need for water that we require Excuse me, that w it's the physical need for water that we experience when our need for water becomes imperative. Scientists say we should drink liquids even before we feel thirsty. Why? Because waiting until we are thirsty indicates we are already lower on the hydration level than our bodies need to function effectively. So they say when you're working out, when you're doing work, when you're uh, you know, uh, going about your daily activities, that you ought to be drinking throughout the course of the day, not because you're thirsty, but rather to prevent yourself from becoming thirsty. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So because the moment you feel thirst, that is an indication that your level is is lower than it needs to be. It's lower than it should be. The moment you begin to feel thirsty, that means that uh, your body has already reached a level that it ought not to, to reach as a rule, okay? So the Word of God said that if we hunger and if we thirst after righteousness, we will be filled. But Jesus said if you believe on Him, you will never hunger and you will never thirst. Why? Because our righteousness is found in Him. In Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 26, listen. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law was not given to help us uh, correct the problem. The law was given to help us identify the problem. Amen. When you go for an x-ray at the hospital, the x-ray does not heal you. But the x-ray helps to determine what needs to be healed. Hello now. The x-ray does not remove the tumor, but the x-ray helps to reveal the tumor so that it can be removed. The law of Moses was never given in order to make things right. The law of Moses was given so that we could know what was wrong. Well, why in the world would God do that? So that we then would yearn for a Savior. So we would yearn for that answer that could come. That would, in fact, make things right. Rather than merely demonstrating what is wrong, we would desire and we would long for something, someone who could rectify the problem. Amen. The law was given so that we would look forward to the coming of Messiah. Amen. Listen. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, listen, which is by faith of Christ Jesus, or of, of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. What is the Apostle Paul telling us? He is telling us that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. How will that righteous, how will that hunger for righteousness be filled? By the presence of faith in Jesus Christ. Because God is a justifier. What does justify mean? That means that God literally corrects the error. He looks upon you as though you had never committed the sin to begin with. You never committed the transaction, the, uh, the, the uh, transgression, transgression. <laughs> thank you, to begin with. I'm getting old, folks. I need Tommy to help me with my vocabulary here. You never committed the transgression to begin with. That is what justified means. There's a simple way of, of defining the word justified, and it is this. Just as if I'd never. That's how you translate the word justified. Just as if I'd never. So he is a justifier of them that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the need, the desire, the hunger, the thirst for righteousness is satisfied by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people will try to force their faith on others. Fundamentalists, and I grew up in the fundamentalist camp, are famous for preaching at people until they break them down or preaching a message riddled with guilt and shame that is designed to emotionally drive penitent men and women to the altar. But to find righteousness, we must hunger and thirst after it. It cannot be something we are told that we need, but something we deeply, inwardly feel the nagging, aching need for. You hear me now? You can preach at people till the cows come home. If that person has no desire, if they don't feel the need in their life to do right or to act right. If there's somebody that's living their life and they live by the mantra, if it feels good, do it. You know, whatever whatever I want to do, I'm free to do. You can preach to them till the cows come home and you may convince them that there's a God. You may convince them that humanity has broken the rules and committed sin and we have offended God. You may convince them that uh, they ought to be saved or they need to be saved. But do you know what you have not done? You have not responded in their life to a hunger for righteousness because they don't care about righteousness. Righteousness is not something they have any interest in at all. Listen to me now. A person who cares nothing about doing right is going to have no interest in righteousness. There are a lot of people in Christian churches today who have no interest in doing right. They're not the least bit interested. Righteousness is not high on their priority list. It is not something they hunger for. It is not something they thirst for. Many people we know after the election of Donald Trump, they don't care how they get their ends met. They don't care how things are accomplished. It can be done crooked. It can be done through all kinds of canals. It can be done uh, by any means necessary. And they're fine with that because how it's achieved doesn't matter to them so long as it is achieved. But God's people are a people who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And therefore, how it is accomplished is every bit as important to us as accomplishing the task. Hello now, am I telling the truth? Amen. It's as important to us. We've got... Republicans around the country today who are doing everything in their power to rig elections. They're doing everything in their power to gerrymander. They're doing everything in their power to intimidate voters. They're doing everything in their power 
to uh, isolate voters. They're doing everything in their power to uh, uh, hinder people from being able to vote. And yet these are the same people who claim, we're the party of God. We're the party of Christianity. We're the party of righteousness. Baloney. Baloney. Because if you were the party of God, if you were a party that believed in righteousness, then you would also believe that achieving your ends can only be done correctly if it is done righteously, if it is done right. You cannot cheat in order to achieve your ends. You cannot connive in order to achieve your ends. If you remember, that's what Jacob did. Jacob connived, and Jacob cheated in order to achieve his ends. But that is not what God desires from us. He desires that we do right, that we act right. But righteousness is of no interest to anyone who is not hungry for righteousness. person who cares nothing about doing right is not going to have any interest in righteousness. No more than, say, a person who cares... Nothing about the environment, for instance, is going to care about the benefits of driving a hybrid vehicle. If you don't care about the environment, and somebody comes to you and says, yeah, but if you drive a hybrid, you know, that puts less of this into the atmosphere, and that does this, and they're going to look at you like you're talking in tongues. They're going to look at you like you're crazy. I don't care. Why do I care? Those things don't mean anything to me. Tommy and I had an experience here a little while back. We brought in a man to talk to us about installing solar on our house. And we were interested in solar because it would save us a lot of money over the long term. And uh, if you put a battery bank in as well, then when you lose power and what have you, you can still have power in the house, you know. So we were looking at a number of benefits of solar, a number of things that we liked about solar. And this man is doing his little presentation for us. And all of a sudden he starts talking about how solar is good for the environment and how solar benefits the ecology and all this. And we're sitting there and like, yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine, uh-huh, whatever, uh-huh. Uh, how, how's it going to save us money? How long is it going to take before it pays for itself? How you right? Isn't that what we did? And this man kept going and going and going on about how solar's good for the atmosphere, how it's good for the planet, how it's good. Listen, I'm not saying that those benefits weren't something that, you know, we were pleased with. But those were not the things we were the most interested in. This guy kept going on and on and on and on. A lot of people do this with the gospel. They talk to somebody who's not the least bit interested in righteousness. They're not the least bit interested in doing right. They're not the least bit interested in doing right by God or by man. And you stand there and you preach at them and you preach at them and you preach at them and you preach at them. And, preach at them and they're not turning. I have a father like this, folks. My father has no interest whatsoever in righteousness, not a drip. And you can preach at him till the cows come home and it all goes right over your head. The Word of God tells us that Noah was, listen to me, was a preacher of righteousness. Noah did not preach repentance. Noah preached righteousness. How many people wound up on the ark because of Noah's preaching? Nobody. Why? There was no hunger. There was no desire for righteousness in the world. The Word of God said that the eyes of the Lord search over the planet. What, what is the language used? There is none righteous. No, not one. Am I telling the truth? Isn't that what the Scripture says? You see, there, that's not talking about there are none who are saved. There are none who are God's people. No, that's saying there is none. There's nobody out there with a desire to do right. And in order for righteousness to be achieved, in order for righteousness to be found and attained, you cannot simply want it because you have some cognitive understanding that it's necessary. You're not hungry and mom sits you down at the table and says you got to eat and you look at the plate and say I don't want to eat, I want to go play. But you need to eat, it's lunchtime, but I'm not hungry. 
I happen to know for a fact that Tommy is one of the most was one of the most stubborn little children that ever hit the planet. And when he would sit down at the dinner table, and mom would say, "Now you need to eat those vegetables. You need to eat those carrots. You need to eat those peas," he'd sit there and say, "I'm not. Well, I don't want to eat them peas." And mom would say, "Well, you're not getting up from this table until you eat those peas." Long story short, he got up from the table the day before I met him. You know, so <laughs> the point is, you're not if you're not hungry, then putting food in front of you means nothing. That it means absolutely nothing to someone who's not hungry. That's why the word of God said, No man cometh unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. That's why we don't just go out and witness hosh posh to every person that we bump into. No, we witness to those people that God opens the door for us to witness to. Why? Because we're going to be effective only when we witness to the right person. How do we know it's the right person? When the Spirit of the Lord draws that person. When God says, aha, I see a hunger in this person for spiritual things. I see a hunger in this person for righteousness. I see a hunger in this person for a relationship with God. I see a hunger in this person to understand what comes after death. Do you follow what I'm saying? Then the Spirit of the Lord says, okay, I see there's something in this person that their, their interest will be in me and therefore he begins to draw them and God will then put somebody in their path who will help to bring them in. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's why we don't go door to door knocking on doors. The Pentecostal movement is the fastest growing Christian movement in the world has been since day one at the turn of the 19th, uh, uh, 1900s. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, it's been the fastest growing movement in the world, and yet the Pentecostal movement has never gone door to door witnessing, trying to proselyte, trying to win people. No, 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 no. You worship God, you do what you're supposed to do, and God draws people. And the Lord will bring people into the church. He'll, people who are hungry, let me tell you, God has ways of getting them to hear the message. He has ways of getting them where they need to be. This guy harped on that point concerning how solar affected the environment and all that, and to make a long story short, he lost the sale. Because he was trying to sell us on a benefit that was not at all on the top of our list. Now, you take somebody who hasn't eaten in a day or two, and you try to sell them a hamburger, and see how hard a sale that is. You take somebody who, I went through some experiences during the six months or so I was in Atlanta. I never went through as hard an experience in my life as I went through in Atlanta. Honest to God, you could not get me back to Atlanta for all the money in the universe, folks. And I'm not kidding. I never went through hardship and difficulty. I went to Atlanta to try to do a work. And while I was there, uh, everything just went wrong. There was someone who had invited me to come who had told me that I'd be able to stay with them until uh, I was able to get my own place and everything. And literally, the day I arrived, this person said, Oh, well, I'm in a relationship now, and, and I won't be able to host you, as I had said. And I literally was there with my car packed with goods. I had to go to a... a uh, storage place and put my stuff in storage and then stay in my car because the only income I had was disability and I had used my disability income to get there and to rent the storage unit. Well, long story short, I went through a period of about a month where I lived out of my car in Atlanta, Georgia. And I mean, it was hot. Dear God Almighty, it was hot. They call it Hotlanta for a reason. I was there, I believe the month I had arrived was May. I had made arrangements to rent a hotel room for church meetings. Uh, and I paid for it out of my own pocket. So I was broke. I had no money. I literally went hungry for days and days. There was one bar in the area that on certain days 
I can't remember the name of it, y'all. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm horrible with names to begin with. And uh, But they used to put out a buffet type thing, you know, with finger foods. Uh, I can't remember if it was every day or certain days. I, I really don't recall. But anyway, that was all I had to eat half the time. And one time I met somebody, and he seemed real nice, and we got along well. And he told me one day, he said, well, you should come by my job. Have you ever eaten at uh, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Winner's Chicken? Have you ever had? I said, no, I've seen the place, but I've never eaten there. And he said, well, I work at Mrs. I think he was in management, actually. He said, why don't you come by sometime so you can try? I, he didn't know I was hungry because I didn't tell him. I didn't run around telling people what I was going through. And I went by Mrs. Winters, and he said, would you like to try our chicken, you know? Oh, that was a hard sell. I hadn't eaten, literally, folks, in about two or three days. I was hungry, Tommy. I'll never forget it as long as I lived there. It was horrible. It was horrible. And I said, yeah, I, I'd love to try it. I said, but honestly, I really can't afford it. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, I'm going to give it to you. Man, I'm going to tell you, to this day, that was some of the best fried chicken. And it was good. Oh, man, was it good. And the pieces were huge, and it, it was good. I brought Tommy out there when I decided to move to Dallas. He and I went to Atlanta and got a U-Haul and carried my stuff back to Dallas. Uh, I took him to Mrs. Winters, and he, he can tell you, that was the best fried chicken on the planet. If you ever get to go through Atlanta, stop at Mrs. Winters' chicken. It is phenomenal. But I'm telling you, Tommy, I ate that chicken. That was like Thanksgiving and Christmas and uh, the Resurrection Sunday all mixed up into one. That was the best meal I ever ate in my life because I was hungry. I was starving. It's an easy sell to somebody who's hungry. It is an impossible sell to someone who has no interest whatsoever. They may be interested in your product, but if their interest is only in this area or that area, if the selling point of your product is like a lot of people who come to church because they get to socialize. A lot of people who go to church because they're hunting for a husband, a wife, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. They're not there to seek after God. They're not there to satisfy their hunger for righteousness. They're not there because they want to live right and do right. No, they're there to find somebody. They're there to, to, to be able to socialize. You know, there are all kinds of reasons that people embark upon what would appear externally to be a spiritual uh, activity or spiritual exercise and yet in reality they're not even interested in things that are spiritual I want to tell you today a lot of people today have never received the Holy Ghost I'm going to tell you why because they've never been hungry for the Holy Ghost I'm not hungry for the baptism of the Holy Ghost I hear the pastor talk about it but it don't mean a whole lot to me I think I can do just fine without it I'm not hungry for the Holy Ghost I remember when I was a kid I was five years old of course now I was always precocious I was always old for my age my mother can tell you uh, honestly I'm not kidding I, I was always very advanced for my age uh, cognitively, I'm, I'm not by any means, I'm not standing up here like Donald Trump claiming, you know, I was a, a brilliant, you know, rocket scientist at five years old. It's not what I mean. But emotionally and psychologically, I was always much older in behavior than I was. And at five, I remember Brother Couts, a man named Couts. I don't remember his first name. Coming into our little Assembly God Church over there on Prospect Street in Naugatuck, Connecticut. And he preached a revival for us. And one night, he invited people that wanted the baptism of the Holy Ghost to come down to the altars. And I went down there at five years old. I went down there to pray. I wanted God to fill me with the Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm going to tell you, life at home was hard. Life with my father was miserably hard. I needed the power that the Holy Ghost gave to make it. And I knew I did. I went to that altar and I began to pray and before too long, the Spirit of the Lord come over me and at five years old, I began to speak with other tongues, speak a whole new language that I never learned that I had no knowledge of. And I began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave me the utterance. 
Honey, I was hungry for the Holy Ghost. Then for the next seven years, I didn't really know what to do with it. Didn't really understand the baptism because I was young. And then at the age of 12, I knew that I needed to stir up the gift that was within me. I said, oh God, I know it's there, but I, I haven't been functioning in the Spirit. I haven't been walking in the Spirit. God, I need you to stir up the gift that is in me. I was hungry. For God to move in my life. And I went down to the altar and I was praying and seeking God. And he stirred up the gift. And once again I began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave me the utterance. And I felt that just, just a brand new outpouring of the Holy Ghost in my life. But from that day forward things were different. Because now I was older and I was able to better understand the benefits of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and understand better how to operate in the Spirit, how to pray in the Spirit, so on and so forth. But there has to be a hunger. My question today is, how badly do you want it? How badly do you want to do right? How badly do you want your marriage to work? How badly do you want your children to love you and respect you? How badly do you want to have harmony in your family? How badly do you want to be free from addiction. How badly do you want to please God and be a witness and a testimony in a lost and dying world? How badly do you want it? Because righteousness only comes when we hunger and when we thirst for it. it God's not going to force anything on you. God is not going to force you to act right. God's not going to force you to do right or to behave right. Neither is he going to merely try to convince you that this is what you need to do. No, because then it becomes a cognitive transaction. It becomes a matter of you know mentally, psychologically, cognitively that this is what you ought to do and therefore you try to do it. That's not at all what God's looking for. He's looking for people who are hungry for it. Who have a desire so deep within them to do right, to live right. Oh God, I want so much for everything I do by you to be good and right and by my spouse to be good and right and by my children to be good and right and my neighbor and my co-worker and so on and so forth. I want to do right. Closing right now. There's a passage of scripture that I absolutely love. And I've said many times when I die, if I die before the Lord comes, I'd love for this scripture to be on my tombstone. I don't even care if you put my name on the tombstone as long as this scripture's on it. I know they charge by the letter, by the word might be a little expensive. It's not the longest scripture in the world, but it's longer than some. Psalm 17 and verse 15. Listen to what David, a man that the Word of God says that God spoke of as being a man after mine own heart. He was a man who did so many sinful things, so many wrong things. But you know what? There was a hunger in David for righteousness wasn't about how he behaved or how he acted. It wasn't about whether or not his humanity got the best of him more often than anything, more often than his desire to do right. But listen to this. Here's how we know David hungered for it. And that is why God called him a man after his own heart. In Psalm 17, 15, David writes, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Hallelujah. So I'll never be satisfied in this life. I'll never be satisfied in this world because I'll never be able to be like Jesus in this life no matter how hard I try. But I will be satisfied when, when I awake in thy likeness. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 57, in closing, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth death, excuse me, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the promise of resurrection. We have the promise of change. We have the promise that one day that part of us that is subject to immorality, that part of us which is subject to corruption, that part of us which is subject to unrighteousness, we are going to shed and we're going to be changed. Hallelujah. And that is why today, like David, I say, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. My question to you today is, how badly do you want it? Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Mm -hmm.